to Esther 5 this week. So, Esther 5, verses 115, where we're kicking off. If you'd like to read through with me. <coughs> Esther 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favour, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfil my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. And he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence. He was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honoured him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife, Jerish, and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows built, 75 feet high, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. Lord God, as we journey through rest of five this morning, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, this morning. That we would learn from this incredible godly woman. So last week we found out Haman's plot to annihilate the Jews in Persia. And <coughs> Esther finds out from her dad Mordecai what's going on. And we were looking at how she humbled herself before God. How they both humbled themselves before God and they came to God first. But then comes the moment to step out in faith. And that's where we're at in Esther 5 this week. She comes to the moment where she has to step out in faith. She has to enter in to the king uh, to come and bring to him this petition to come and try and save her people from complete and utter destruction. Uh, as I was reading this, it, it reminded me of Matthew 14. Uh, and in Matthew 14, the disciples are on a boat and, and, and they see Jesus walking on the water towards them. And it tells us that they're terrified. Um, which isn't really that surprising. But then in verse 29, Peter, it, he, he calls out to Jesus, if, if it's you, command me and I shall come. And then it says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water and came towards Jesus. But what happens next is he sees the, the wind and he sees the waves and he's overcome with fear. He begins to sink in the water until Jesus grabs his hand and pulls him up. And what struck me is that we so often focus on the fact that he sank when we read that passage, on the fact that he lost faith and started to sink. The incredible thing is that he walked on water. He, it tells us he stepped out of the boat and he began to walk on the water, his eyes fixed on Jesus. He didn't know whether he would sink or he would walk, but he fixed his eyes on God and he acted in faith. He stepped out, literally stepped out of the boat in faith. And we see that happen with Esther here. 
She does not know. We, right at the end of Esther 4, she said, whether I, I, I live or I die. She doesn't know if she's going to live or die, if she's going to survive this attempt to go and talk to the king. But she steps out in faith, her eyes fixed on God. The Bible tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, these are two huge things that we see right here. Peter stepping out to do something incredibly supernatural. Esther stepping out whether she lives or dies. And the really important thing there is the step of faith. Yes, Peter loses some faith. He gets a bit scared. He lets the he lets the world wobble him and he begins to sink. But he had faith. He made that step in faith. And Esther's making this big step in faith. She's got her eyes fixed upon God. And she's stepping out. And there's an important lesson for us here in this about us stepping out. Not worrying about the sinking Worrying about the living or the dying, but the stepping out, eyes fixed on Jesus. There's this incredible moment in Daniel where his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be thrown into the furnace. But this furnace is so hot that when the guards get close to it to throw them into the furnace, the guards drop dead from the heat of it. They will be thrown into this furnace because King Nebuchadnezzar is unhappy with them because they won't worship this idol. And in verse 16 it says, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They had such incredible faith and trust that God would, could, if he deemed it, save them from this fiery pit. And yet they didn't know for sure that he would, but it didn't matter because they were going to step out in faith anyway. Throw us in the fire. God, we know God can save us and if, if that's his plan, he will. And even if he doesn't, we worship him anyway, and we're not going to bow down to your idols, to your gods. What an incredible, incredible bravery and incredible faith to do that. We see that with Esther here. Like I said last week, if he didn't hold out that golden scepter, she's dead. It's very immediate. Regardless of the cost, regardless of the consequences, will we be a people like Esther, like Peter, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that step out, eyes fixed on God. So Esther steps out in faith, and amazingly, as we just read, the king is, is happy, he's delighted to see her, and he holds out his scepter and spares her life, and, and she comes forward, she's allowed to come forward to him. And then she doesn't petition on behalf of the Jews. She doesn't come to him and say, you, you've ruled that all of my people are going to die. Do something. Help. She comes forward and she says, come to a feast. And at first glance, you might think, well, that's a bit strange. But actually, you've got to remember that, first of all, it told us in the previous chapter that it had been 30 days since she's been with her husband, the king. So he's called down to her for some reason or another, or been distracted uh, from her, perhaps. And so she knows that she's got to do more than just catch his eye at this point. She's got to, she's got to bring him in. But this is also the king, remember, that picked his advisors over his previous queen. And he holds Haman in great esteem. At this point, Haman is effectively the Prime Minister of Persia. And so for her to step forward, not just to petition on behalf of her people, but to go against Haman, this is a big deal. And she knows that it's got to be more than just a blurting out of something as she enters into the king's 
chamber. And she's clearly put the legwork in, because if she's inviting to a banquet, she must have a banquet ready for him. So she's gone out there in faith that he, God will spare her, that the king will spare her, and that she can then take him to this feast. She is showing, showing such great humility and great wisdom as she humbles herself before her husband, the king, putting her life in his hands. Great wisdom, just indulging his ego. She, she knows he loves a feast. That this book of Esther begins with him throwing this absolutely huge and ridiculous feast. He loves a good feast, he loves a good banquet, and he absolutely loves people flattering him. She does both here. And he realises this, because it then tells us that he asks her during that banquet, well, what is your petition? Because he's realised there's no way she risked her life just to invite me to dinner. There's something more here. So the penny's dropped for him. He's like, something's going on here. And yet again, she hasn't yet approached this subject. She wants to throw another banquet for him and for his best buddy. And she tells him she'll, she'll bring that petition tomorrow. And now he's really intrigued. He's really curious. And yet in all of this, she's not shown any arrogance. She's not shown any, any sign of being <coughs> right or trying to one-up him. She's coming before him in, in humility. In his commentary on Esther, David Firth comments that times in prayer and fasting do not justify believers behaving in ways that will <coughs> alienate those we meet. Spiritual preparation and sensitivity must complement each other. Esther has spent three days in prayer and fasting along with her maids and asked her dad, Mordecai, to go with the rest of her people. They fast for three days. They've put God first, they've come to God first, before she then takes this step of faith. And in taking that step of faith, she goes in with such humility and with wisdom and just trusting in God. Not trusting in her own strength, not trusting in her wit, not trusting in her being able to somehow win him over. But just goes in with humility and she's trusting in God that she lays this groundwork and she throws these banquets and she and she strokes his ego that God's doing the work he's laying the ground and that she's getting ready to bring this huge petition there's a great contrast in this passage though because if we look at Esther and then compare and look at this man Haman and look at his hubris. Read in verse 11 that he boasts of his wealth, he boasts of his family, he boasts of his position, the honour that he has from the king. And now he's like, and the queen invited just me. He thinks he is, you know, the best thing before sliced bread. And yet despite this, he's still not satisfied. He still wants more glory. He sees Mordecai and he is robbed of his happiness because he has such a shallow happiness. He finds his happiness in his own glory, in his own people glorifying him, in his own power, in his own money, in his own strength. That's where he finds his glory, that's where he finds his happiness. And he's robbed of it as soon as he sees this man that will not put him first because this man worships God. <laughs> Such a contrast here to Esther. Such a contrast between this humility and this hubris. Between her wisdom and his arrogance. Between her kindness and his cruelty, his brutality. Proverbs 26 warn us against arrogance. Like snow in summer or rain in harvest, honour is not fitting for a fool. 
like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. A whip for the horse, a halter for the donkey, and a rod for the backs of fools. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Mm. Like cutting off one's feet or drinking violence is the sending of a message by the hand of a fool. Like a lame man's legs that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like tying a stone to a sling is the giving of honour to a fool. Like a thorn bush in a drunken's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an archer who wounds at random is he who hires a fool or any passerby. As a top return, dog returns with vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs has just gone on and on about fools. And then it says, man wise in his own eye, an arrogant man. There's even less hope for him than there is for a fool. This is Haman. Haman is wise in his own eyes. He thinks he's so clever. He spent the time made friends with the king, he's got right in there to the inner circle, he's now bought his petition and the king has agreed, we'll wipe out the Jews because this is what you want, Haman. He thinks he's so clever and he glories in his own wealth and his own prestige and his own power. What we see in this passage here is a warning against that arrogance and that pride. But we also get this masterclass from Esther in how godly women and men should behave. Saint Augustine of Hippo said, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. Esther's actions ultimately <laughs> point us to Jesus Christ, the divine and holy God, showing such humility in coming down and becoming a man. He came down to his creation. He showed love to the weak and to the poor and to the sick. He taught us using parables, he who knows everything, and yet taught us in a way that we could understand. shows such great wisdom and such great love and such great humility he cleans the, the feet of his, his friends and he shows us the ultimate act of humility by dying on the cross it's so easy for us to turn people away from God away from gospel truth if we conduct ourselves with arrogance with prideful hubris with an air of I'm right and you're wrong Esther could have stormed in there so sure that her <laughs> husband would spare her so sure that her husband would spare her people exactly what Haman would have done. He'd have been sure of his position as the king. He'd have been sure of his own wit and his own cleverness and his own power. But no, Esther goes in there with great humility. We need to be like Esther ultimately. We need to be like Jesus and act with humility, show wisdom, show kindness and love. Not to compromise our faith. Remember, just a few weeks ago, we looked at Mordecai taking a stand. When it came to choosing between God and merging in with his society, he chooses God. 
when it comes down to it, we have to fear God. We have to put God first. And we have to take those steps of faith, no matter what. We're not supposed to be belligerent. We're not supposed to be arrogant. We're not supposed to upset people in the way that we behave. There were many times we see in the New Testament that people get really upset with Jesus because they couldn't take the gospel truth that he was telling them. We were talking about this yesterday morning in Men's Breakfast, how the gospel brings peace. It brings us peace through reconciliation through Jesus Christ. You have to accept Jesus Christ to get that peace. And there are so many this world is so against that that it's like a red rag to a ball sometimes to bring the gospel truth to people. People will get upset. People will be angry, afraid. Sometimes they're going to react to us. React to our sharing the gospel with them or just react to us living good, Christian, godly lives. Because they don't want to accept that gospel truth. How they react to the gospel isn't down to us. We leave that to God. So like Esther, we take a step of faith. We act in humility, we act with wisdom, we act with love. If the gospel upsets them, so be it. If us trying to live lives the way that Jesus taught us, trying to walk the way that Jesus walked, upset people, then so be it. And it will. Because the gospel is so countercultural. There's too much at stake for us to be going out into the world and picking a fight or going out into the world and acting with arrogance or with pride. John 3.16 we all know this one, I'm sure. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There's too much at stake. God calls us to be a loving people, to be a humble people, to be those that pursue peace. Esther sets us a great example. She had no idea how her husband would react to her coming forward. She knew there was a good chance she would die. And so far, and that's why I haven't got to the point yet where she actually brings her petition. So at this point, she still doesn't know. We still don't know what, how's this going to end. How is he going to react when he finds out the truth? The question is, will we step out in faith? Thank you for Esther, Lord, what a godly woman and a great example for us. She is. But ultimately, Lord, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. That we might have salvation, <coughs> Lord God. Lord, help us to be a godly people in this time and in this nation and in our culture. Help us to be humble. Help us to show wisdom. Help us to show love to those around us, Lord. Lord, help us to share your gospel truth, your gospel story, that story of incredible, incredible saving for each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to keep the rest of it up to you.